Racecraft by Barbara J. Fields and Karen Fields. Chapter 8, Individuality and the Intellectuals. An imaginary conversation between Emile Durkham and W.E.B. Dubois. The American reviewer of a recent travel book about France marveled at the author's account of a despised people called the Cago or Cagots. The rituals that sent them apart conjure up the American South during much of the 20th century. Forbidden to marry outside their group, restricted to designated entrances and seating at church, where the communion host was delivered from the end of a stick, required to announce their presence by an identifying badge, which might be a goose foot pinned to the tunic, and so on. According to the reviewer, the mystery of the Kagots is that they had no distinguishing features at all. As the following essay illustrates, different appearance is by no means essential to the deployment of a double standard based on ancestry. The essay juxtaposes America's turn of the 20th century Negro problem with France's Jewish question of the same epoch. It imagines two great founders of sociology, Emile Durkheim and W.E.B. Dubois, examining together the prospect of universal human rights. Religion is first and foremost a system of ideas by means of which individuals imagine the society of which they are members and the obscure yet intimate relations they have with it. That was a quotation from Emile Durkheim um, from the Elementary Forms of Religious Life. W.E.B. Dubois found few promising interlocutors among American social scientists when he wrote in 1903, the problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line. The relation of the darker to the lighter races of men in Asia, in Africa, in America, and the islands of the sea. While everyone recognized the color line, not everyone considered it a problem. For some, indeed, the color line was the solution. Economically, its benefits were obvious, whether in America or in Europe's far-flung colonies. Morally, the darker races continued for less than the lighter ones, or counted for less than the lighter ones. For scientists, the theoretically interesting problem was not the color line itself, but the biological basis of differences and different treatment that were held to be self-evident. To see the color line itself as a puzzle or a problem required an, an ability to look skeptically at the evidence of one's own eyes. For that subject, white American researchers, like white Americans in general, had little space on their mental templates. But in France, where races and colors figure, figured in a different way, Dubois would have found a promising interlocutor, Emile Durkheim. Durkheim found questions of theoretical interest in import, not self-evidence, in Europe's racial identifications, though all Europeans were what Americans would designate as white. Pursuing fundamental questions about religion and reason, Durkheim began the studies in the late 1890s that culminated in his 1912 masterpiece, The Elementary Forms of Religious Life. Durkheim pursued those questions through sustained analysis of Aboriginal Australia's racial identifications, though all were black by American standards. In the process, he exposed the raw materials of mind and devices of social life by which social groups fashion a collective understanding of themselves. However, usual readings of forms generally do not keep those various levels in view. In today's studies of race, for example, Bits and pieces from forms travel separately from it, reduced to glib formulas about the social construction of collective identities. As a result, we lose sight of the living subjects and active verbs by which Durkheim arrived at the hard-won discoveries of forms. We also overlook the historical context in which he won those discoveries, that of the Dreyfus Affair. This huge storm exposed a racist undertow in the politics of France's Third Republic that arrested Durkheim's attention, and that of W.E.B. Dubois. Imagining them in conversation, therefore, is one way to draw fresh lessons from the sharp wit, spiritual heat, and abiding theoretical preoccupations of Durkheim's astonishing book. 
However, to draw those fresh lessons from forms, it is necessary to retrieve two facts, often, often forgotten or ignored. First, that they were contemporaries. Durkheim was born in 1858 and Dubois in 1868. Second, that in their own lives and scientific work, they grappled with comparable predicaments when racist politics took center stage in their respective societies. The Durkheim and Dubois section below explores their com comparable predicaments. The next section lays out possible topics of conversation between them. A fragment of one such imagined conversation then follows. Academics traditionally imagine conversations in order to work out lines of intellectual descent, relating Durkheim to Comte or to Marx, for example, thereby sharpening our, our reflection on enduring problems. We also use them to explore intellectual contemporane contemporan fuck. contemporaneity and sometimes do so with a vividness that registers the ongoing life of classical problems. For example, a recent collection that applies the term misunderstandings to markedly different positions that Durkheim and his contemporary Max Weber held without regard to one another. Here, an imagined conversation between Durkheim and another contemporary he never met will, among other things, suggest new answers to long-standing questions about his shift in the late 1890s toward the study of religion. Given that purpose, I range freely over other writings without necessarily stopping to revisit traditional debates with other purposes. Prepare now to encounter these profoundly engaged men of science on terms they could have set if they had looked out over the social world together when their science was new and promising. They met on a Paris afternoon in 1916. The human costs of the war have been staggering. They ponder what is to be done if, as both hope, the Allies win. They, of course, do not know, as we do, that Nazism lies over the horizon of that victory. They begin on intellectual common ground. They agree that in forms, Durkheim uncovered fundamental truths about humankind. And most centrally, the diverse corollaries of his sobering conclusion that unreasonable divisions of humankind seem to be born from reason itself, not from its opposite. But what should be done in light of those truths? In that regard, each is disconcerted by writings of the other. Dubois by Durkheim's 1898 article, Individualism and the Intellectuals, and Durkheim by Dubois' 1903 book, The Souls of Black Folk. Although both believe that upholding the value of humanity as such is the central problem of their time, each reproaches the other for having taken it up at the wrong end. Durkheim finds in the Negro of Souls an unwarranted particularism. Dubois finds in the qualité d'homme of individualism an unwarrantable generality. Now, as then, that disagreement does not stand open to facile choice between their positions, either conceptually or in the realm of politics. I have borrowed from the ancient form of the dialogue because it suits questions that can be answered coherently in at least two different ways. Durkheim died in 1917, but Dubois lived on until 1963 and repeatedly revised his answers. In America and in France, the questions and arguments are with us still. Durkheim and Dubois, the predicament of individuality in the 1890s. Common ground in the preoccupations of forms. I offered above an unhabitual reading of forms, as if it were obvious and in no need of justification. Since neither is the case, let me begin again by briefly summarizing the book's rather particular theory of religion, which I consider to be inseparable from its account of collective social identifications. The scaffolding of its main argument is an extended study of collective identifications imagined in the same way as races. The totemic clans of Aboriginal Australia. Unlike the Europeans' racial identifications, however, those of the Australian Ab Ab Aborigines cannot possibly be construed as natural. Their claims of common traits and common descent implicate animals, plants, and sometimes physical objects, as well as other human beings. Durkheim's general question is this. 
How is it that humans come to hold on to beliefs about cosmic nature that cannot possibly be true? And that, besides, cosmic nature unceasingly contradicts? He finds the answer in their social being, which is also the source of the most fundamental human capacity. Reason itself. Australia's totemic clans, Durkham argues, permits study of that social being and reason itself in elementary form, elementary meaning basic and in consequence universal, not meaning inferior or a peculiarity of designated peoples. But that answer raises another question of, equi of equivalent import. How is it that humans come to embrace beliefs about themselves that cannot possibly be true? And that besides their human nature contradicts. In that second inquiry, fundamental to the first, Durkham studies the collective alchemy by which reason converts bald-faced inventions into, ex into external and constraining facts of nature, capable of resisting individual doubt. To see this point concretely, let us turn to a stark example given by the real Durkham that would have arrested the attention of my imaginary Dubois. A kangaroo, shown a photograph of himself by anthropological investigators, uses his relationship to his own photograph to illustrate for them his relationship to the kangaroo. Look who is exactly the same thing as I, he tells them. Well, it is the same with the kangaroo. Durkham adds that the kangaroo was his totem, which is to say that he traced his descent through the membership in a clan with the name kangaroo, and was as much like his fellow clansmen as he was like the kangaroo. Such statements must not be taken, Durkham warns, in their everyday empirical sense. The kangaroos do not resemble the kangaroo, nor do they necessarily resemble one another. Moreover, they do not resemble one another, or differ from white cockatoos, for instance, in ways that would give both groups internally unifying and mutually exclusive common traits. What makes them alike is the abstract notion of common essence, kangaroo-ness, bearing the same name logically presupposes it, Special affinities and moral obligations of various kinds derive from it, and so too for Durkham does the human capacity to form concepts. Any imaginable name essence can express the overthrow of perception by conception. White cockatoo, black cockatoo, emu, lizard, even louse. Through periodically repeated ritual and through symbolic reminders between times, the name essence is experienced as palpably real. In that way, it gains an objectivity that makes individual dreams of repudiating the shared identification not so much unremable un or undreamable as irrelevant. Such shared identifications are not negotiable contracts. In vivid set pieces, Drickham depicts these shared identifications as becoming immediately real to the participants in frenzied rites, which he calls effervescences or effervescences collectives. My imaginary Dubois would thus have given full attention when Durkham wrote on the very first page of forms that he was not studying Australia's rights for their own sake, but because they promised access to something fundamental and permanent about present day man, since there is no other way we have a greater interest in knowing well. So, sorry, since there is no other that we have a greater interest in knowing well. Durkham made this point even more prominent in the first English translation of 1915 by dropping his French subtitle, Le système totémique en Australie. La question juive, the Negro problem. Even so, at first glance, nothing would seem more distant or different from Australia's totemic clans than the racial designations of Europe. They might seem less distant, however, if one imagined the France of the 1890s while reading Durkham's vivid, and it seems to me, troubling descriptions of the effervescences collectives that enabled Australians simultaneously to create and experience their exotically contrary to nature collective identifications. Durkham, the scientist, if still alive in the 1930s, would have seen that point demonstrated in the rights of the Nazis. I suspect that Durkham's intuition may have begun with effervescences collectives that he had seen operating in France in precisely the same way. As a Jewish child growing up in Alsace, 
he surely heard about and may have witnessed the anti-Semitic demonstrations to reaffirm and rearm Frenchness that came in the wake of France's traumatic defeat by Prussia in 1870, making Alsace-Lorraine German. In 1894, there was the court-martial for treason of Captain Alfred Dreyfus. Dreyfus, the first Jew to rise to the general staff of France's army, was falsely accused and convicted of passing secrets to the German government, and saw that conviction reaffirmed even after the real culprit had become known. In the wake of his trial, or rather anti-Semitic railroading, came ugly street demonstrations and a nationally, di nationally divisive struggle for justice that went on for 12 years. During those years, Durkham, the sociologist, became Durkham the activist and a co-founder of the League for the Defense of the Rights of Man and Citizen. Dubois reports having watched the Dreyfus affair closely. Perhaps he drew a parallel between the frenzied French crowds and the American ones that sometimes seized pris prisoners and lynched them. Lynchings had wide enough acceptance for a New York Times headline in 1900 to read, Negro murders a citizen, posse are looking for him and he will be lynched. Perhaps he saw a parallel with another defining court case of the same era, Plessy versus Ferguson in 1896. In that case, the Supreme Court of the United States found the segregation laws being enacted in the South to be consistent with equal treatment under laws supposedly guaranteed by the 14th Amendment, Amendment of the Constitution, adopted in the wake of the Civil War. That case and the political developments it epitomized announced the 20th century world in which Dubois, the sociologist, was shortly to become Dubois the activist and a founder of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, NAACP. From the same vantage point in time, however, and faced with what seemed to be, or seemed to me analogous outrages, Durkham wrote in a quite different spirit from Dubois about the line between Jews and Christians in Europe. If he imagined the possibility of a coming crisis along that line, he did not say so. What he said instead, together with the spiritual heat of forms, provided my point of departure. In in Individualism and the Intellectuals, he wrote in defense of the agitation to free Dreyfus, and specifically in response to Ferdinand Brun Brunetier, an ardent anti-Dreyfusard, who had recently blasted individualism as anti-social, anti-patriotic, anti-French. For the anti-Dreyfusards, for the anti-Dreyfusards, in groups such as the Ligue de la Partie Française, the honor of the army, hence that of the nation, was the fundamental value at stake. Durkheim's article is passionate, a masterpiece of concise argument, justly famous and yet on the surface rather strange. It is a response to the judicial railroading of Captain Dreyfus and to resurgent anti-Semitism in France. But it never mentions Dreyfus or Jews. Indeed, Durkham says, let us forget the affair itself and the sad spectacles of which we have been the witnesses. Given the sad spe spectacles to be seen in America, therefore, I imagine Dubois in rather sharp discussion with Durkham about what he chose to say and not to say in that article. But since Dubois would, have, would also have understood Durkham's position, it seems to me they would have had much to say to one another about the complexities and the perplexities of living out one's own creative intellectual life amid the, amid the constraints of having not one, but two pregnant identifications. In Durkham's case, French and Jew, in Dubois, American and Afro-American. The common historical context of these two great social scientists was a time when the Negro problem in America and the Jewish question in France imposed themselves on the working lives of talented individuals, thereby forging and shaping their individuality. In forms, Durkham repeatedly argued, correctly I believe, that individuality takes shape within collectivity. Nevertheless, let me underline the term individuality. While my task is to set both men's work in the social context of a certain time, I do not mean to reduce those men of genius or their work to just that particular social context. 
to avoid crudely causal metaphors that dissolve individuality in collective identification and reduce complex thought to single themes, I propose uncrudely causal metaphor, that of irritating sand in a pearl producing oyster. Without the irritation, there is no pearl, but the form of a pearl cannot be predicted, explained, or even adequately described in terms of the sensation and the suffering that produce it. Durkham and Dubois as contemporaries. Since we so consistently think of Dubois and Durkham separately, let me now add other dimensions in which it is instructive to think of them together. First, if Dubois' academic career was possible only in the context of his people's emancipation, so too was Durkham's. Both men were inheritors of great emancipations following great democratic revolutions. That of French Jews came through a series of decrees beginning in 1790, which released them from various restrictions. That of most African Americans came 75 years later as an outcome of the Civil War, which Dubois sometimes spoke of as the Revolution of 1865. Although some among them, Dubois' grandfather, were emancipated at the time of the American Revolution. In addition, both men thought, taught, and wrote with passion about what democracy required amid the social and above all economic turbulence of the late 19th century world. Also, because they were committed Democrats, they were committed univer universalists. For the same reason, I think they read and listened to the socialists with attention, although neither rushed to embrace socialist politics for different yet perhaps related reasons. Second, as pioneers in sociology, they opposed biological or quasi-biological understandings of the new discipline. Each lived on a racially defined edge of his society. In consequence, I submit each was in a position to experience the social, intu the social intuitively as a realm fu fundamentally distinct from the realm of nature. Dubois' 1899 study, The Philadelphia Negro, argued against the racist theorizing that was common in American social science. He deployed empirical evidence to show that the causes of the pathology to be found in Philadelphia's seventh ward were social in character, not emanations from the inner essence of black people. He attacked racist arguments by providing detailed evidence of normality and advancement to which he also assigned social causes. It followed that the racial theorists' quasi-biological causation could not accommodate those two opposite effects. Dubois' American colleagues would already have seen Durkham use that same strategy in Suicide uh, from 1897. There, for instance, he set up and then picked apart statistics about European races that could have been used to allege that Germans carried in their blood a sad primacy in killing themselves. Third, although both men were witnesses to the terrifying racist and proto-fascist developments of the 1890s in their respective democracies, neither was prompted to embrace emigrationist strategies in response as propounded, for example, by Bishop Henry M. Turner in America and by Theodore Herzl in Europe. Both argued in word and deed not only that reform in the land of his birth was possible, but also that the scientific investigation of social life provided the would-be reformer of that land with tools. Because some of the necessary tools were to be had in Germany, each traveled there early in his career. Durkham in 1885 to 86 with a government fellowship just after his aggregation and Dubois in 1892 to 94 with, phil with phil philanthropic support just before his Harvard doctorate. Society is seen from outside. In ways that, like their situations are different, yet comparable, Durkham and Dubois picked up the tools of social science from a particular position that combined a designated racial outsiderhood with an actual cultural insiderhood. Both men were inheritors of comparatively recent and still incomplete emancipations. Neither was fully free or fully armed as a citizen. The everyday weight of those realities must have been epitomized in both men's minds by the two court cases of the 1890s that I mentioned earlier, Dreyfus in France and Plessy in America. I think of Dubois as an outside insider 
and Durkham as an inside outsider. In terms of his Protestant values, Harvard education and general culture, Dubois was far more like than unlike the mainline elite of white American academics in his day. He was excluded from his upper sancta only because racist practice foreclosed his becoming, to use his phrase, a co-worker in the kingdom of culture. Although he published important scholarly works in important places, his individuality had to be extruded through the narrow apertures of America's system of Jim Crow in both the North and the South. One result, I think, is the high spiritual temperature of all his work, together with qualities of both topic and rhetorical mode that I think of as its outsider imagination. Those qualities, I submit, he shared with a Durkham of forms. In terms of education and general culture, Durkham too was also more like than unlike the main line of French academics in his day, but he was included in their upper sancta and integrated as a Dubois-ian co-worker. The ideology of Republican France was, as Americans would say today, colorblind. Careers were open to talent, or so it must have seemed, until the Dreyfus affair. Nevertheless, Durkham was free to implement his vision of sociology from the pinnacle of French higher education, first at Bordeaux, where he began building L'année sociologique with a team of colleagues and pupils, and then at the Sorbonne, where he continued and, in addition, became a powerful university administrator and politician. What is more, Durkham had the task of helping to reform education throughout France in accordance with the secularizing agenda of the Third Republic. His chair at the University of Bordeaux bore the twofold title, Pédagogie et Sciences Sociales. There came a time when his courses in the sociology of education were required for all French students who aspired to teaching careers in the humanities and social sciences. It is said that his graduates working in little villages would wave away ignorant meddling priests and ex-schoolmasters with sheaves of their lecture notes. Dubois had no such Archimedean point in the American Academy. To suggest then that Durkham's predicament and Dubois were comparable is not to minimize the differences. Those can be sketched in a rough and ready way by historical what if. What if in 1897, Harvard had created a chair in sociology and appointed Dubois to it? Notwithstanding such differences, here are two individuals who must have shared a marrow deep intuition that the external and constraining social fact of bearing a collective racial identification is the source and resource of human individuality, including that of creative genius. Even if Durkham's days were not necessarily shaped by the aspersions of those who called his work Talmudic sociology with anti-Semitic intent, he lived in the atmosphere created by the propaganda that spread through print and caricature in the 1880s and 1890s. For example, the two-volume book of the journalist and newspaper editor, editor Edouard Dumont, La France Juive, Essai d'Histoire Contemporaine, Contemporaine, 1886, was an enormous bestseller. According to one analyst, Dumont was the first to set up an explicitly racial opposition between Semite and Aryan. Then came the accusation of Dreyfus, who had risen as a talented, hardworking individual, and above all, as a loyal Frenchman, but found himself accused and hated in his collective racial manifestation as a Jew. At the very least, Durkham must have lived in a state of continual irritation. Hence my image of the sand and the pearl. I submit that oops I submit that if we read forms against the backgrounds whose importance I have been sketching, we find therein traces of that irritation. Forms is not only audacious but also obnoxious and heated in ways that he and Dubois will notice below. What is audacious and obnoxious about forms is not only that in it Durkham seemed to divine divinize society. That was bad enough at a time when some of the French were struggling to resuscitate a dying traditional god from whom Durkham had withdrawn his allegiance. 
It is also that his argument entailed the social invention of precisely that Frenchness, which some of the French were embracing as a matter of common descent, to which he held no access. Furthermore, there is a caustic and ironic display of paradox in the dead serious, yet at one level hilarious, accounts presented in forms. There, dark-skinned men paint physical resemblance, for example to white cockatoos, onto their bodies, and then, looking at the resemblance they themselves have just painted, affirm that they have shared it with those birds and with one another from time Im immemorial. According to his showings in forms, anything at all could serve this purpose, without in any way disturbing anyone's assumptions about real resemblance. I do imagine Durkham laughed to himself as he kept making that point with different examples, in the process showing that three distinct species of lice have been called into service to designate three distinct kinds of human beings. I think of those moves, forms as full of them, as eruptions from his outsider imagination. A, rela a related element of that outsider imagination was his taste for paradox. And I mean paradox literally, not as strangeness, but rather as against received teaching. Recall how the vignette of the man kangaroo informed him about the workings of reason, not the supposed unreason of primitives. Early on, his preface to the rules of socio sociological method, 1894, feistily declared, if the search for paradox is the mark of the sophist, to flee from it when the facts remain it, it or sorry, to flee from it when the facts demand it is the act of a mind that possesses neither courage nor faith in science. It may be that the qualities I have just noted are the same ones noted in the perennial charge among Durkham's comment commentators that both his conception of society as a reality sui generis and his rhetoric are extreme. For example, at the start of his masterful intellectual biography of Durkham, Stephen Lukes says that Durkham's style often tends to caricature his thought. He often expressed his ideas in an extreme or figurative manner, which distorted his meaning and concealed their significance. But I believe Durkham was fully in charge of his prose. Therefore, if that prose seems hotter than seems hotter than seems called for him called for by his subject, then a review of our own understanding of his subject may be called for. It certainly is more than religion as conventionally understood. I say the same about the disparagement of his rhetorical mode as manifesto-like, a trait that would put him in infamous and suspect company. People like the Dadaists and the Surrealists to come, or the Marxists, who for some were suspect already. Durkheim's tendency towards stark, even shocking formulation is sometimes explained, not mistakenly, I think, so long as it is not explained away, as a scientist's zeal in various debates over the object, structure, scope, and methods of sociology. But important as that point is, and I would not dream of diminishing it, I suggest that, even if his sociology could be separated from his rhetorical mode, and I doubt this can easily be done, much more than that is at stake. After all, a scientist's zeal does not lead a life separate from its human source. Spiritual intensity and rhetorical excess in the work of Dubois have, so far as I know, puzzled no one. Those qualities are routinely, routinely recognized in his work. He termed them double consciousness and wrote about the experience. Of Our Spiritual Strivings, an essay published in The Souls of Black Folk, gives us an imaginary conversation with a white compatriot who asks him, how does it feel to be a problem? For Dubois, double consciousness meant an irreducibly complex awareness of himself as his own self, an unsettled and always evolving subject, and at the same time as a despised object, fixed in caricatures, braced for the daily ritual insults of outsiderhood, enduring in all ways what Adolf Reed calls the ascriptive lot of a racial collectivity. 
but outsiderhood also carried with it an ability to stand on the edge of that very world to which he could not fully belong, and from that vantage point to see beyond its seemingly self-evident givens. He called that capacity second sight. Here's the way he put those claims. After the Egyptian and Indian, the Greek and Roman, the Teuton and Mongolian, the Negro was a sort of seventh son, born with a veil and gifted with second sight in this American world. A world which yields him no true self-consciousness, but only lets him see himself through the revelation of the other world. It is a peculiar sensation, this double consciousness, the sense of always looking at oneself through the eyes of others, of measuring one's soul by the tape of a world that looks on in amused contempt and pity. One ever feels his two-ness, an American, a Negro, two souls, two thoughts, two unreconciled strivings, two warring ideals in one dark body, whose dogged strength alone keeps it from being torn asunder. Dubois waged battles to re-educate America's collective consciousness, partly to prevent the apparent justification of outrages of all kinds, and partly because this consciousness served as a mirror whose reflections were one source of a tormented double consciousness among black Americans. He sought to disrupt the social processes that invented the Negro as the object that he called a tertium quid, more than an animal, less than a human being. Turn to Durkham, however, and the corresponding battles become indirect and convoluted. In an 1899 article, he conceded that certain failings of the Jewish race could be invoked to justify anti-Semitism, but insisted that those failings were counterbalanced by virtues. Mm. Besides, he wrote, the Jews are losing their ethnic character with an extreme rapidity. In two generations, the process will be complete. If he and Dubois had spoken in that year, Dubois might have told him that, in the last analysis, cultural similarity or difference was not the heart of the matter. His exemplary study of Philadelphia's Seventh Ward did not earn him a post at the University of Pennsylvania. This insult was tendered to the Negro he was, not to the cultured New England Calvinist he also was, with ancestral roots in America going back to before the American Revolution. Durkham, however, embraced the France of the Declaration of the Rights of Man. That is, not the France of Gobineau, but the colorblind republic. Unlike Theodore Herzl, who considered French racism vis-a-vis -vis Jews to be an authentically native product, Durkham regarded it as a German import, amounting to no more than a consequence in the superficial symptom of a state of social malaise. It was true, he conceded, that in France, certain right-wing Catholic ambitions had started to batten on that malaise. But he reasoned that if anti-Semitism had indeed been the rank flower of Catholicism in the 1890s, its fresh flowers would have been in full bloom 20 years earlier, when religious sentiment was, if anything, stronger. Yet this was not true, he claimed, and so it was more likely that anti-Semitism was not intrinsic to Catholicism, but in epiphenomenon of social disorder and economic distress. His solutions were to seek justice, to mend the social fabric, and to educate the French differently. I do not minimize either his analysis or his solutions. Every aspect of the problem is complex. I simply point out that he advanced nothing like the Duboisian agenda of doing battle forthwith and very directly to take the tertium quid out of play and to replace it with a full-scale human being. Hence this from Durkham. When society undergoes suffering, it feels the need to find someone whom it can hold responsible for its sickness, on whom it can avenge its misfortunes. And those against whom public opinion already discriminates are naturally designated for this role. These are the pariahs who serve as exp expiatory victims. What confirms me in this interpretation is the way in which the result of Dreyfus's trial was greeted in 1894. There was a surge of joy on the boulevards. People celebrated as a triumph, which should have been a cause for public mourning. At, le at last, they knew whom to blame for the economic troubles and social distress in which they lived. The trouble came from the Jews. 
The charge had been officially proved. By this very fact alone, things already seemed to be getting better, and people felt consoled. In other words, whoever or whatever cannot lay claim to fellow feeling is available for designation as society's it. Dubois's tertium quid, at whose expense that fellow feeling is affirmed. Durkham does not stop to examine how the tertium quid is created. Looking back years later, though, he placed in the late 1890s his revelation as to the importance of religion. I suspect that those observations about the Dreyfus affair let us glimpse one intuitional source of forms. What can be known for certain is that Durkham reproduced this formulation almost exactly in the last chapter of Book 3 on Rites of Mourning, which famously demonstrates the independence of such rites from the subjective states of individuals. There again, however, he does not stop to examine how the expiatory victim and its fate come into being. If every death is imputed to some magical spell, and if, for that reason, it is believed that the dead person must be avenged, the reason is a felt need to find a victim at all costs on whom the collective sorrow and anger can be discharged. The victim will naturally be sought outside, for an outsider is a subject less able to resist, since he is not protected by the fellow feeling that attaches to a relative or neighbor. Nothing about him blocks and neutralizes the bad and destructive feelings aroused by the death. Possible topics of conversation. If Durkham and Dubois had had a talk in 1899, they made explicit the common features of their different predicaments. Dubois or that made explicit the common features of their different predicaments, Dubois might have upheld his own public actions against the Negro as America's tertium quid, but relating both of those passages to Durkham's famous relativistic definition of crime and the rules of sociological method. Following his own principle of relating social facts to other social facts, Durkham there defined crime as that which is repressed in any given society, thus permitting the conscience collective to affirm itself. That analysis holds the criminal character of an act not to be intrinsic to it or valid for all societies. But if Rules was right in its claim that crime and repression of crime have the positive function of providing the means and the occasion for reaffirmation of the conscience collective, then it would seem priorhood would work analogously. Periodic affirmations of priorhood would then have the function in social life of permitting the periodic affirmation of insiderhood. Looking ahead now to forms, if Durkham was right there, then in both instances, public opprobrium, ritually enacted, would simultaneously create and express what it would thereafter be alleged merely to have expressed. In addition to all the other achievements of mourning rites that Durkham sets forth, they also define the boundaries outside which stands the victim. In Dreyfus's fate, crime and priorhood came together. As a citizen found guilty of treason, he was sentenced to deportation for life to France's steaming prison colony in Guyana. As a member of the army elite found guilty of disloyalty, he was subjected to a solemn degradation ceremony on the parade ground of the École Militaire as part of his sentence. The defacement of his uniform, the breaking of his sword, and the shouted insults of his brother officers while the crowd added their voices from outside in the street. An artist's rendering of that huge ceremony in the courtyard of the École Militaire appeared in Le Monde Illustré. A different talk in 1899 might have exchanged programmatic statements that both Dubois and Durkham had made about the agendas each had for the properly sociological posing of social problems. Durkham, in The Division of Labour and Society, 1893, and the rules of sociological method, Dubois in the Philadelphia Negro and in sociolo sociology hesitant, an extended critique of American sociology that, for various reasons, he never published. A talk in 1901 would have revealed Durkham's invitation to leave Bordeaux for a post at the Sorbonne, there to keep building his équipe and its research journal. In addition, one aspect of his work at the Sorbonne would be to lay a scientific basis for secular public education in France. Durkham would have learned that Dubois had been dreaming analogous dreams in 1897 when he went to, when he went to Atlanta University, 
there to busy himself with plans to build his own laboratory, his own team, and a series of publications. Dubois's or Dubois, Dubois's grand proposal was to document the working out of, of democratic or ideals central to the West for the previous hundred years by conducting a broad gauged longitudinal study of emancipation in America, his Atlanta studies that talk about the successor regimes to slave trading and slavery might in turn have led them to discuss the imperial élan of Republican France, just then consolidating exploitative interests in Asia and Africa and in the islands of the sea. And as two recent analysis analysts put it, inserting a ring in the nose of the Republic. They could actually have met in person in 1900 since both traveled to Paris for the Exposition Universelle. Dubois had major responsibility for an, for an exhibit, which won a gold medal, a Negro achievement since emancipation. Durkheim was there lecturing at the Congrès International de l'Education Sociale, an event that was part of France's contribution to the exposition. Or they might have come to know one another by reputation through the American Journal of Sociology, for which Durkheim was an advisory editor from 1895 until the war, and in which a response by Dubois to a scur scurrilous paper titled, Is Race Friction in the United States Growing and Inevitable? appeared in 1904. If the two had met in 1916, they could have discussed their respective patriotic writings in the service of war against Germany, with Dubois making it clear that America's involvement was inevitable, as well as desirable. Let me mention these writings, but for now, characterize only briefly certain differences between them. Durkheim was writing government commissioned pamphlets and open letters to the French, and so he was able to speak, as it were, in major key. By contrast, Dubois wrote his wartime exhortations for the crisis, the magazine of the NAACP, and in minor key. He insisted that black Americans must prepare to fight enthusiastically over there on their own behalf, as Americans of long lineage while knowing full well that it was vital to prevent their enemies at home from adding disloyalty to the already long indictment of the race. Both men looked forward to improvement after the war. Durkheim was enthusiastic about an enriched vitality and a heightened moral enthusiasm that could be husbanded once peace was reestablished. Then he thought it would be possible to revive the sense of community, to render it more active and make the citizens more accustomed to combining their efforts and subordinate their interests to those of society. Like Durkheim, Dubois saw over the horizon of allied victory and looked forward to renewed fervor, but the fervor he welcomed was specifically that of black Americans. Writing as, writing as usual in the minor key of double consciousness, Dubois felt certain, nonetheless, that victory by the allies would help spread new ideas of the essential equality of all men. In 1916, the two men might also have discussed each other's contributions to wartime documents of a different sort. As editor-in-chief of the crisis, Dubois not only continued to display Afro-Americans' achievements, but also began publishing evidence of their patriotism and willingness to die for their country. Those displays were meant as Exhibit A against the gathering racist onslaught and were produced in an extended report after the war. Along with double consciousness went what can be called double death, dying once for America and once for Afro-America. Dead or surviving veterans, African Americans had to be counted as black dead or black survivors, else their sacrifices on America's behalf would not be recognized as such. If Dubois had been watching his colleague closely, however, he would have seen that Durkham faced the same predicament. In his capacity as president of the Research Committee for Documents of the Société des Etudes Juives, by 1916, anti-Semitic attacks were on the rise often taking the form of slurs against the loyalty of Jews, who were said to be German agents. Durkheim himself was publicly slurred by name at least twice during that year, notwithstanding the loss of his son to the slaughter. In that climate, the research committee of the Societe 
began collecting and verifying the names of Jewish soldiers killed, wounded, decorated, or promoted during the war. According to the committee, the love which they bear for their country does not command them to deny their Jewishness. It is not without interest to know how Frenchmen of Jewish origin, who have not embraced another religion, conducted themselves in the war. Among France's fallen heroes, too, the outsiders had to die twice, once to defend the country against external enemies and a second time to defend themselves against internal ones. Wide publicity was accordingly given to the exploitive rabbi Abraham Bloch, who was killed while delivering a crucifix to a mortally wounded Catholic soldier. Individualism and the Intellectuals, a Fragment of Conversation Therefore, a conversation in 1916 could have moved from the sad spectacle of double death to Durkheim's instruction at the start of Individualism and the Intellectuals. Let us forget the affair itself and the sad spectacles of which we have been we have been witnesses. It will move from there to the fact that this remarkable piece does not mention Dreyfus, Jews, or anti-Semitism. The article does not so much attack the attackers as defend the defenders, and proclaims the central issues of the affair to be the preservation and expansion of individualism and reason. Those, he claims, go infinitely beyond the actual incidents and should be separated from them. One need not claim otherwise to observe, nonetheless, that individualism in the intellectuals seems an abstract response to a blood and guts issue. In that article, we learn from Durkheim that the individualism of the French utilitarians, also of Spencer and the economists, is rightly attacked as incompatible with social existence. But there is another individualism which he calls its opposite, that was formulated in the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen, and is the very basis of social existence. This individualism makes the human person the touchstone of a morality. It is individualist, because man is its object and man is individual by definition. The individualism of the rights of man takes on the character of a religion in which man is the believer and the god. Therefore, an attack on life, liberty, or honor is like profaning an idol. No, no raison d'etre no, sorry, no raison d'etat can supersede this individualism, contrary to Brunetier's claim, because it is prior to the state. This individualism has left its ivory tower company of Kant and Rousseau, and has so deeply penetrated institutions and mores that to remove it would mean reforging everything top to bottom. Furthermore, such is the social diversity of the modern world that the only thing held in common is humanness, la qualité d'homme. There is nothing to love and honor collectively, if not man himself. Far from being the source of anarchy, then, individualism is the only system of belief capable of ensuring the moral unity of the country. To defend it is therefore nothing less than to defend the very patrimony of the nation. Durkheim goes on to describe the religion of humanity, which has all it which has all it takes to speak just as authoritatively as the religions in it replaces. This religion does not flatter the instincts, but does violence to them, a point about religion he makes repeatedly in forms. For the sacredness of the individual does not arise from individual characteristics, and individual characteristics do indeed work against solidarity. This cult of which the individual is agent and object is not addressed to who the person is and has his name, but to the human person wherever met with and in whatever form incar incarnated, it glorifies the individual in general. But who is that individual in general? Dubois might have asked Durkheim as a prelude to recounting an enigmatic story about individual identity and collective identification as he had experienced them during his travels through Europe between 1892 and 1894. My dark face elicited none of the curiosity which it had in, in blonde Germany, for there were too many dark gypsies and other brunettes. I saw poverty and despair. I was several times mistaken for a Jew. Arriving one night in a town of North Slovenia, the driver of a rickety cab whispered in my ear, Unter der Unter die Juden, 
among Jews. I stared and then said yes. I stayed in a little Jewish inn. I was a little frightened as in the gathering twilight I traversed the foothills of the dark Tatras alone and on foot. Okay, this is where I guess the actual discussion between Dubois and Durkham starts. Fantasy discussion. Dubois says, I know your individualism and the intellectuals. When I wrote The Souls of Black Folk, everything within me pushed how does it feel to be a problem onto the page. But even if some, but even if someone held a pistol to your head, I don't think you could write. How does it feel to be a question? It's as though everything within you pushed it off your page. You rest your case on a certain qualité d'homme that you suppose joins us all amid the diversity of the modern world. I think you've rested your case on shifting sand. Um, Durkham says, Ah, uh, perhaps, but it is the only place I have to rest it. If in France we can just proceed with a scientific understanding of the kind of society France is, we can realize the promise of 1789. As I wrote in that article, with social diversification, the growth of individuality reaches a point where the only thing held in common is humanness, la qualité d'homme. There's nothing to love and honor in common if not man himself. This is why man is a god to himself and can no longer make other gods for himself. Both savor this turn on the Ten Commandments. Dubois says, no doubt, my dear, my dear Mr. Durkham, that elevated sentiment greatly calmed the very Catholic Mr. Brunetier. Wicked chuckles from both. I too know how to plant minds on my pages. But, you know, it's not the religious minds that blow the most shrapnel in America. It's, say, my comparing illiterate Negro peasants with illiterate Austrian clodhoppers showing the published illegitimacy rates among the Negroes to be no higher. I need not be close enough to have a cigar and a cup of tea with a white Jim Crow Southerner to know his likely reaction to my transgressing the color lines etiquette, even with statistics. Laughs. Seriously, though, I am convinced you are right about the kind of morality we need. I myself wrote that one stream of modern thinking is swollen from the larger world, and that the multiplying of human wants in cultural lands calls for the worldwide cooperation of men in satisfying them. Hence arises a new human unity, pulling the ends of earth nearer, and all men black, yellow, and white. But to leap from that useful unity to a shared moral humanity poses a question, not an answer, and it is the question for any religion of humanity. You see, I went on to say this, behind that stream of thought lurked the afterthought of force and dominion, the making of brown men to delve when the temptation of beads and calico cloys. So in the end, who is Lum that Lum should take account of him? They laugh, recalling the eighth psalm. <coughs> Durkham says, I know what you mean. How Lum comes to recognize Lum morally is the most important question our discipline can help us answer. Dubois says, but you seem to assume rather than demonstrate that Lum can possibly recognize Lum in the abstract. I thought you showed precisely the opposite in forms, that a man can become convinced he is as different from another man as a kangaroo is from a tree louse, when actually they all look as much like one another as you French do, or as they say, you of the Latin race. Eyes twinkling. Durkham says, Quite so, you caught that one, did you? Vulgar empiricism will no more give you physical resemblance between a man and a tree louse than it will the resemblance between two members of the tree louse clan, or yes, two members of our Latin race. That is that, for the vaunted races of Europe, and besides, for your different races in America. Human mentality is flexible enough to accommodate the most disconcerting designation, n'est-ce pas? The whole raison d'etre of my work in education is that human mentality can also accommodate other designations that are, to reason, rather less déconcertante. But we must inculcate the young with them, and we must see that they are enacted periodically. Forms is about a human world. 
that world exists through human doing and is therefore our own ethical responsibility. Dubois says, That is true, but even so, again I ask, what constitutes lum? Let's suppose it means having a soul. If it's having a soul, a spark of divinity from that divinized social unity of yours in forms, then think about that unseemly outburst of mine, the souls of black folk. It was my exhibit A for La Qualité d'Homme. In it, I set my soul, our souls in colored America against something else, namely the sincere and passionate belief that somewhere between men and cattle, God created a tertium quid and called it a Negro. All my words about double consciousness and about how it feels to be a problem finally led some people at long last to suspect my, our humanity. In other words, the humanity of that tertium quid. Reverend Washington Gladden, gallant warrior for social justice, went so far as to tell his congregation that reading souls would give them a deeper insight into the real human elements of the race problem than anything that had yet been written. The human elements notice. What on earth did they imagine before? But if I had ever doubted what claiming those human elements meant to some of my compatriots, the New York Times reviewer dispelled all doubt. According to the Times, souls boiled down to something very simple. Dubois' hidden personal agenda was to smoke a cigar and drink a cup of tea with a white man in the South. Durkham says, so it is that way in America. Then again, perhaps I do know what you are talking about. A century and a half ago, Moses Mendel Mendelssohn was, how did you say it? He was in Exhibit A. Most people still doubted that Jews had la qualité d'homme. Some thought Jews might have it. Those were the open-minded ones. And so never having met la qualité d'homme in a Jewish body, they invented it as a purely theoretical possibility to debate over. Enter Mendelssohn. His task was to try to prove in the flesh that a Jew could be a philosopher, esthete, even Prussian patriot, and most of all that a Jew could be virtuous. Dubois says, I think I understand, and that's not so very long ago. But look what happened next. If he was a human, for them it followed that he ought to embrace Christianity. No, my dear Mr. Durkham, I am unconvinced that it's enough to talk up now only about shared universal humanity, your lovely qualité d'homme. I came to believe long ago that each group has its special gift and brings that to common humanity, a place where we can then agree, maybe, to be co-workers in the kingdom of culture. Even now I maintain my position that peoples have to battle their way into common humanity, tribe by tribe. Durkham says, what did William James say about your book? Since the 1890s, we've been reading with great interest his provocative work in psychology and his philosophical arguments about the nature of truth. Was James not your teacher? Dubois says, Oh yes, he thought The Souls of Black Folk was a decidedly moving book, and he sent off a copy to his brother Henry, noting that it was written by a mulatto ex-student of his. Durkham says, after pausing, Ah, oui, I think I comprehend your predicament. Dubois says, let's come back to our qualité d'homme in this war. Durkham says, it is true, my dear Mr. Dubois, your predicament and mine in this dreadful war is to record second deaths of our own people. It has not been enough simply to count the corpses. We cannot, we cannot count and mourn everyone together in their qualité d'homme. Still, if we just take hold of the present vitality in this land and guide it, we can complete the great work of our grandfathers. Malgré tout, I still believe as I did in 1898. If we build that religion of humanity as we should, there will be strong opposition to all that threatens our common faith. If every enterprise directed against the rights of an individual revolts, us, it is not only by sympathy with the victim, Neither is it for fear of having to suffer like injustices ourselves. It is that such attacks cannot go on with impunity without compromising the nation's existence. I think sociology can enable us to bring that about. With it, we can uncover the profound dynamics of social life that make the social world we see before our eyes. Dubois says, 
I read that arc, arc, I read that article. You went on and on about individualism and reason. You got more and more heated as you went on. Such attacks can't be made, you thought, without arousing the sentiments that were violated. Those were the only sentiments that could bind the nation, so they couldn't weaken without disrupting the cohesion of the society. <coughs> Otherwise, there would be un veritable suicide moral a veritable moral suicide oh that was french i very tab suicide mor moral a veritable moral suicide without individualism and reason there is moral suicide hellfire preaching that mr durkham still you had the sinners dead to rights men of impoverished conviction you called them they weren't apostles overflowing, overflowing with anger or enthusiasm, you said. They weren't savants bringing forth products of research and reflection, you insisted. They were men of letters seduced by an interesting theme and playing games of dilettantes. So you thought it impossible that those games of dilettantes would manage to hold the masses for very long. If we knew how to act, you said. Your we was whoever in democratic France embraced humanity as the reason and the goal of morality. Durkham says, I did say all that. I deeply believe all that. Yet I am, like you, reconciled to gathering invidious memorials of double death. For now it cannot be helped. At the time W.E.B. Dubois began his work on the problem of the color line, Emil Durkham had set for himself the problem of religion. In particular, religion's characteristic fright of false statements about nature and humankind with their singular capacity to survive disproof. If he had not underlined his interest in present-day man, his itinerary might not have crossed Dubois in the ways I have suggested, and we might well hold that his study of Australian totemic cults has little to teach us about his social world or our own. But for me, at least, forms invites new sorts of conversation about collective identifications, formulated so as to link sociolo sociologists with colleagues who approach the study of human intellect with the different toolkits of disciplines, such as economics, philosophy, and brain science. If Durkham is right, obvious physical difference is the wrong place to start, but so too is reason conceptualized with individualistic models. Again, if Durkham had conceived religion differently, for example, as the subjective experience of individuals, his intellectual itinerary might not have converged with Dubois. But those itineraries did indeed cross because Durkham located religion in human groups. In the social and intellectual processes that designate groups, their boundaries, their members, and the place of all the foregoing in the larger cosmos. Conceived that way, religion met race not only in the rare rarefied world of philosophy and scientific theorizing, but also in the real world of ethical choices and practical politics. I think this is why nowadays Dur Durkheimian ideas find themselves on Duboisian terrain. In studies of race, the notion of double consciousness jostles that of collective identifications produced in social life. Even so, the two men's different approaches to the practical questions have not resolved into one. What is to be done is no more obvious now than it was on my invented Paris afternoon in 1916. I cannot say what difference it would have made if they had met. What I can say is that the stakes were high, as the unfolding of the 20th century proved. <laughs>